Those were the two largest flood, flood events on record for a lot of these gauges. So the statistics were based on data without those you know, major flood events. So we, we're revising that hydrology to be more updated, to be more relevant to you know, our current record, our current flood record. Um, so this is just another, this is a picture of all of the established floodplain boundaries um, for the Carson River. And you can see it's sort of a quilt of different zones. And a lot of these zones are approximate, which means there's no flood elevation for this area. You know, all the green zones you see here, there is no flood elevations listed. Um, it's very uh, separated and disjointed. Um, some areas have floodways, some areas don't. Some areas are approximate, some areas, some areas are detailed. Um, it's just a real mismatch of, um, of flood, you know, flood plains. And that's very difficult to manage you know, for the local communities along the river. So our tool will actually integrate all of these areas into one large model and one flood plain um, with floodways and elevations along the whole river. That's another one of the objectives. Um, so we're looking for detailed, up-to-date flood hazard mapping um, for the Carson City, Lyon, Douglas, and Alpine. Um, and then we need this tool. We can look at watershed scale floodplain impacts. When you have these short studies on different communities, you can't look at the impacts that development in Douglas County will have on Lyon County. You, you cannot do that with the current technology and the current tools. Um, we want a watershed scale. We want to look at those impacts. And then we want some consistency. You know, we, we want to have consistency in the modeling and the approach. Um, we don't want to have, you know, 10 different kinds of models. Some are proprietary, some are not. We'd like to have a really concise model that people can use, that anyone can use for the, the Carson River. Um, so the, our study area for all the phases, um, I'm going to go through the different phases of the project. Um, MOS 1, or Mapping Activity Statement 1, was Lyon County. Um, MOS 2 is Carson City. And right now we're working on the Douglas and Alpine County portions. That's the MOS 3. And then MOS 4, the fourth phase, will be the mapping of that Douglas and Lyon County. Um, so this is just a, a map of the whole area. So we've done, we are completed up to the Carson City line. Of course, it says Carson City County here. We know that's wrong. Um, but right now, we're working on the Douglas County portion and a small bit in Alpine County. So that's the overall study area. Um, so what type of analysis are we doing? We have, we have new data and new tools to, to do this analysis. Um, we, the effective flood insurance study, uh, you know, as I said, the hydrology is all based on 80s and 90s estimates. You know, we, we are going to, we, we have revised those peak flows to represent the, the two large events that happened after those studies were done. Um, we are also using a different approach for the hydraulics. You know, traditional flood studies use a steady state or a flow in an instant of time. You hear about the 100-year flow or the 1% flow. That is a single flow in an instant in time. And the traditional approach has been to apply that flow throughout the river. So if your reach was 20 miles long, they're just mapping that one flow across the whole river. We know that floodplains don't work like that. Flows get attenuated, they move over bank. They, the, the peak flows go down and up as the river moves. You know, there's a timing element to that, to that issue. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not a very robust way to look at a floodplain because that's not how floodplains work. Um, the new model that we're, we're incorporating um, and developing is an unsteady state. So we're looking at flow over time instead of just a standard set flow instantaneous in time. Um, you know, we're looking at this flow that changes over time. And with that, we can look at the timing and the volume changes in the floodplain. Um, you know, we can look at these impacts as they move down the system. Um, we can look at the flood wave as it moves. It's a dynamic tool. Um, you know, floodplains attenuate flow. They dissipate energy. That's what they do. Um, so this is sort of an example of that type of analysis. You're looking at time on the x-axis and flow on the y. Um, this is the 97 and the 2006 flood in Carson City. Um, you can see there's a component of time. You can look at the timing 
and the volume. The volume of the flood is all the area underneath those curves. You can look at how much water goes through the system. Um, so that's sort of our new data, new information. The new tool that we're using is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers PECRAS 5.0. And right now, we are beta testing this, this software for the Corps of Engineers. And the new module is a two-dimensional um, hydraulics module within that, that software. You know, before it was just one-dimensional. So I'll talk a little bit about two-dimensional modeling and how that's even better than one-dimensional versus steady and unsteady. Um, so the different model elements that we're putting together is the stream center line, flow paths, cross-section, bank lines, and then this 2D computational mesh. Um, so within the, the modeling world, you're looking at most traditional models that have been one-dimensional. So flow goes in one direction, up to down. Um, 2D modeling, flow can go multiple directions, which is what flow does when it gets out of the channel onto the floodplain. You're looking at the flow in two dimensions. It's a, it's a, you know, you're adding a level of complexity <coughs> and a level of analysis in you know, double what you were before. Um, this is sort of a classic look at a one-dimensional model. The model calculates water surface elevations in the channel, but it applies that water surface over straight over the whole cross section. Um, you know, as we know, these overbank areas have different hydraulics, different amounts of flow. These areas aren't necessarily at the same water surface elevation as the channel. You know, this, this flow may not even get out into the overbanks, but the way a one-dimensional model looks at the world, it just applies that flat water surface across the whole cross-section or the whole geometry. Therefore, you're not really getting a, a true picture um, of what's going on in the overbanks. Um, so that's one of the limitations of a 1D model. This is sort of an example of how those 1D models are set up. You just have a series of cross sections along the river, and it would compute the hydraulics from section to section to section. Um, now, this is not a bad way to do it. You just have to know how to set that up to avoid the problems of that one dimension. Um, this is how a 2D model works. You can see that there is flow in lots of different directions. You have the X and Y component. It, 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 it knows when the flow can get out into the overbank. It looks at the terrain, it looks at the hydraulics, and it can move flow in many directions. You can look at these backwater, these eddying effects. You can look at you know, the varying velocity and direction of flow in the overbank. This is a much more robust way to look at um, 2D modeling. And this is just a video of how those models work and the capability of visualizing your floodplain hydraulics. You, you couldn't do this with a one-dimensional model. Um, and this is from that new PECRAS um, software. And you can see there's a lot going on here um, that you can capture these flood hydraulics. And look at different water surface elevations. It's not necessarily the same throughout the whole section. Um, so what we're using for this new Carson tool is 1D and 2D integrated together. Because 1D is better for modeling structures, and if the flow path is known. Um, so we're using a 1D approach in the channel itself, and you can see sort of a schematic here of the 1D, 2D. But once that flow gets out into the overbanks, we know it's not a straight shot. It's moving all over. We may not even know where, where it goes or how it moves. Um, that's why the 2D is much more robust in, in modeling these types of situations. Um, so this is just an example. That's the confluence of the east and west forks. Carson River. Um, and this is a, a sort of a screen capture of what we're developing right now. Um, and then hopefully this, this was supposed to be a video. I think we got showing the 2D model. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the results. Um, and I may, if I have time, I can load up the video supposed to be on there. Um, so some of the results. Hydrology, flood hazard maps, and this watershed scale tool. So these are some of the results that we're looking at. Um, this is the revised hydrology um, in the various locations for the 100 year event. Um, you can just see some, some of the comparisons. The effective is what's the 100 year now, and then our proposed, and you see it's not changing too much. 
but there are some changes in the hydrology, you know, based on new statistics and better information. <laughs> This is what the flood hazard maps are looking like. This is just an example of our flood hazard maps. Um, this is part of the second phase, the, the Carson River area. Um, and so you can just see that these are, you know, that we're going to be having the floodway, floodplain, and 500 year flood limits on all these maps. Um, and then we, we have this watershed scale tool. Um, you know, we can look at these impacts, these cumulative impacts. We can look at the changes in peak flow and volume. We can have base flood elevations. We actually have a number of you know, flood elevations for the whole river throughout. Um, you know, we, can, we can look at these complex hydrodynamics, floodplain hydrodynamics. Um, and then we can look at proposed condition. You know, this is another really powerful, <coughs> powerful use for this tool. You know, we will have an entire a watershed scale river model, and we can go in and change, put encroachments in, change land uses, put restoration projects in this model, and we can look at the impacts for all the way from Alpine County down to, to Lyon County. Um, you know, it's not just a localized effect, and that's not how floodplains work. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about, how's my time? Are we pretty good? So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the impacts. You know, why, why are we looking at this in an unsteady world or a 2D world? Um, if you look at this graph, this is, this is the flow for the second phase of our project, or the Carson City Reach. Um, and you're looking at two scenarios here. One is before we have encroachment or building in the floodplain, and then one is after we have you know, encroachment or building in the floodplain. And what you're seeing here is this is the um, pre-construction or pre-encroachment hydrograph. Um, and so you're seeing a lower peak flow and it's moved back in time. So once you encroach on these floodplains, you get rid of your storage, you are increasing your flow by almost 500 CFS at the downstream end. And you're also speeding up that flood wave by two hours, which means you have two hours less to respond to that flood wave as it's moving down the system. Um, this is a fairly significant, this is one reach of the river, um, the impacts of one reach. Um, so that's um, you know, one, of the, one of the things we can look at, you know, what are, our, what are our activities in the floodplain doing to flow and timing of the flood wave? Um, this is stage or water surface elevation for that same situation. Again, you're moving that up two hours, and you're, you're raising the water surface elevation by seven-tenths of a foot. If you've put your house one foot above the base flood elevation, and there's encroachment upstream, you know, you're, that water is lapping at your doorstep at this point. And we, don't, we can't analyze this with a, with a steady state, you know, one-dimensional model. We need this kind of tool to look at these kinds of timing and volume impact. Um, so this is the, an example of the, the 2D modeling that we're doing down in Douglas County. These hatched areas are all the 2D domains for the model. Um, and so a lot of this is done in 1D. It's a, you know, through the Carson and Lyon areas, it's a, it's a very narrow floodplain. It's, it's concise. We know which direction flow goes. So we can model it in 1D. We can set it up correctly. You know, in the Carson Valley, we have no idea where that water is going to go. On, on, um, you know, we have some some data from the '97 flood event, um, but you know, it's it's dispersive flow. It's 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 bifurcating everywhere. You know, that's what the, the advantages of this 2D model are. Um, <coughs> that's just sort of a picture of the areas we're doing in 2D. Um, so the the project status right now is. Um, We've submitted both phases one and two um, to FEMA. Those are still under review. And then there will be a 90-day comment period that the public can comment on the results um, after FEMA has made their own internal reviews. Um, and then we are finalizing the 2D elements um, for the third phase of the project for the Alpine and, and Douglas County. And we're anticipating September 
there's been some delays on the final release of this model. Um, so we can't send this to FEMA until the model is, is actually released publicly. Um, we are beta testing, so we have access to the model. But until it's released, then we're going to submit the results to FEMA. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Um, if there's any questions, I can try and answer those. Greetings from my neighbor, Val Dinos, goes down the street in the um, Have you ever addressed the how of, of, of your data accumulation? I'm picturing guys with transits and measuring sticks and spotting uh, levels. Uh, and the reason I bring that up, uh, I don't want to turn this into a commercial. My son, Tom, is currently working for a, a corporation in San Francisco called Skycatch. They use, they, they use uh, small unmanned aerial vehicles. Right. And uh, they can overfly terrain and, and take billions. They talk about having uh, servers in the sky, billions of data points with one overflight down to millimeter accuracy with the satellite uh, you know, uh, source material. And, and, and they're doing work with mines and other kinds of organizations, uh, FAA notwithstanding. <laughs> if you don't do it, you're a dummy. You know, everybody's going to get ahead of you. But uh, has, that, has that been a consideration at all in, in regard to just data accumulation? Yeah, in 2012, we flew the entire Carson Valley with LIDAR. Okay. And that was sort of pre, the drone thing is a very new technology. It's just that this is a burgeoning thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of potential, but that wasn't real prevalent, you know, sure. a couple years ago. So in 2012, when we saw an opportunity because the flows were so low in the river, um, there was virtually no river in the, in the Carson, or, or no water in the Carson. Um, so we took an opportunity to fly the entire valley um, at that time, and, and we got really good updated topography for that whole third phase of the project. Previous phases, we used LIDAR that was collected in, I think it was 07. Before. Yeah, and we did supplemental surveying. You know, we surveyed all the structures um, by hand. R.O. Anderson did a lot of our survey, um, you know, of structures and that sort of thing. Just one short statement. Um, now that it's uh, it's dry here, you know, this is a really good time to be doing what you want to do, building the levees and so forth. Right. You know, please do it now. Don't wait until. Just the mapping portion of it, there's no state lands. I mean, state lands has been at our stakeholder meetings and they're aware of the process and we're working. I mean, they're, they're involved in the, the community. Um, they come to our meetings, they're, they're involved in what's going on. But technically, we're just mapping the floodplain. Um, and that's they a. They are not mapping, is that, if I remember correctly, numbers are really plus or minus three feet in elevation. So for the mapping? Yeah. No, no, the mapping's, I mean, the mapping's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, we're doing hydraulics based on topo that's plus or minus half a foot. One more quickie, uh, uh, following up on Ed Aldean's observation about uninformed civilians, and I, I plead guilty, but uh, one of the things that, all, uh, you know, the urban areas with the intense impervious surfaces and the effect of water coming in. We've been talking about 1D and 2D. Right. How do your models account for? Uh, I know there's been a lot of work down with the the, um, the new freeway bypass, and, and NDOT has done a lot of work on flood mitigation and basins and things like that. Right. Now, how, how do you handle the inflow from collateral water coming into the uh, river as well? Um, in addition to we're, we're adding inflow hydrographs from all the tributary areas to account for the volume that comes in from all the tributaries. You know, we have gauge data on the, on the main stem and east and west forks, but there's a lot of volume coming in from all those tributaries. Um, so 
we are adding volume to compensate for that um, volume coming in. So yeah, and, and the 2D model can handle that sort of you know, convergence of flow, and that's a lot of the reason we're using it. I think you have one more. Is uh, the schema Yeah, they have an agreement with HEC. Because of the rigorous testing that HEC does, any RAS release is, is instantly accepted by people. Because of their agreement. I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Fawcett from NOAA. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, flood inundation mapping program that um, we're starting off. Um, as uh, Brenda mentioned, my name is Mark Fawcett. Uh, I actually work for the National Weather Service office up at uh, Reno. Um, load it up here and. Actually, pretty good that I'm following Mitch because this sort of builds on uh, all the engineering studies that get done, all the hydrologic modeling that gets done. Um, ours is primarily a display program. It's a little bit misleading. The title here. Uh, it's not really our mapping program or our, uh, it, but it's a way to put it out there for the public uh, and for the emergency management community to use. So our primary mission, uh, actually the Weather Service's primary mission as a whole, is the protection of life and property. Uh, we do that through issuing uh, warnings, watches, advisories, uh, routine forecasts, uh, both for water uh, and weather as well as climate. Uh, but primarily in the hydrologic program, uh, you can see where our goal and our mission is to provide timely and accurate uh, warnings and forecasts uh, that will help uh, to protect that life and property uh, as we uh, try to get that information out to the public and to the emergency management community. Uh, so the AHAPS program or the AHAPS flood mapping program in the Weather Service started as a genesis of some flooding in the plains back in 1993 and then got a bigger boost from the flooding uh, in eastern North Carolina associated with Hurricanes uh, Floyd and Tropical Storm Dennis in 1999. Uh, but primarily what we're looking for here is this bullet here. Uh, deliver impact-based decision support services uh, for environmental and economic productivity uh, and potentially for homeland security. And this is our measure of success down here. Um, this is all kind of rolled into what we're now calling the Weather Ready Nation. So this is basically what we do in a traditional sense right now. We essentially use text products to issue warnings uh, and forecasts for the uh, rivers especially, uh, but also for the regular, for the, uh, regular weather. Um, and used by the emergency management, law enforcement, and actually the public as well. Uh, but what we found in the last few uh, significant flood events, and this is from uh, the Nashville area uh, back a few years ago is that while everybody understands our products, they don't necessarily understand the message or the risk involved in the products. Uh, so, and so this facilitate improved access to data and ensure an operating picture. So what we're actually looking for is something to look at, not just to listen to. Um, and again, this is again from Nashville. Uh, where the, uh, they were aware of the impacts, but didn't really know how it was going to directly impact a particular area. We could say all day, well, uh, we got to get to a major flood level, it's going to flood these areas, but if you can't really see it, sometimes it's hard to visualize that by just hearing it. So, the uh, flood mapping program that we have, which is again a display program more so than an actual mapping program, uh, speaks to this one primarily right here. Need to communicate flood risk by an enhanced, to be enhanced by the use of essentially maps. Uh, so instead of hearing something, you'll actually 
you could actually look at it to see the areas that may be flooded. So this all put, uh, plays into our Advanced Hydrologic Prediction Service, which is a separate uh, website that we have within our website, uh, our, within our primary website. Uh, and again, I'm not going to read the entire thing here, but it involves partnered flood inundation mapping. On the AHAPS website, which if I have time, I'm going to actually pull up a, a, a site out in Boise uh, that actually has these maps loaded up now. Um, you'll get not only sort of a, a hydrograph of what is going to happen and what has happened, uh, but also a, a little bit clearer picture of the areas that could be flooded. Uh, and that's what we're really kind of looking to get out more so to the public and the emergency management community. Um, we're finding that people want to see those things. They don't just want to hear what may happen. So this is uh, our primary AHAPS webpage as it looks at our office right now. Uh, all the uh, squares and the dots are, flood, are stream gauges that are across the area. Some of them are forecast points, some of them are not forecast points. Forecast points are primarily the circles. Uh, this was done originally, we, we started working on this on the Truckee Basin uh, at uh, Reno and Vista. Uh, so some of this is adapted from that as well. Uh, but you can see here I have circled the Carson at Carson uh, City. Um, one thing we have to do is sort, of def is sort of confine the area that we're looking at. So we can't do the entire Carson Basin. Uh, everything has to be associated with a stream gauge uh, and associated with a forecast point that we actually uh, produce forecasts for on a routine basis. Um, so, possible flood inundation site for us is the uh, Carson River, Carson City. Um, there are already daily forecasts that have been done by the California Nevada River Forecast Center, and that's a good thing. Uh, otherwise, we would not be able to do this without forecasts. Uh, they do their own modeling over there. Um, it's not as extensive as what a uh, mixed organization is doing. Um, but it's good for daily use, for a, kind of an overall picture of, of the, what we think the actual stream flows are going to be um, within a degree of accuracy. Uh, we do the actual watches and warnings uh, for this point. In fact, we do that for all of the points in the western part of the state and the eastern Sierra. So, another look here. Um, quickly, there have been while there are you know, a couple of thousand forecast points in the United States, uh, only a little over 100 of these have been converted to these sites that have inundation maps. Part of that is, it takes quite a bit of money to do it, and uh, it takes quite a bit of time as well uh, to get all this together. But here's essentially what you'd be looking at. This is uh, an example from Vista, uh, where we have a hydrograph and our impact statements. And these are mocked up maps. Uh, this is not from the Vista area itself. Uh, this is another site. Um, I just kind of put all this together to show the impacts with uh, what a map would look like uh, in through that area uh, associated with that. So essentially boil down to what we want to do, develop these inundation maps and link them with observed forecast river stages. Um, and to that, we want to include the water depth, if possible, uh, the boundary of the expected flooding, uh, and associate these with our flood categories and with FEMA's, uh, FEMA's uh, flood frequency uh, events. A, pretty, a lot goes into this, uh, and primarily it's a stakeholder and partnered activity. Uh, when I say we are going to do this, well, in fact, the Weather Service does very little of it, we provide the platform uh, once it's done, uh, as opposed to doing the bulk of the work. And in fact, I can tell you that uh, as a federal agency, we really don't have any money uh, to do that kind of thing. Uh, that's where uh, the partners come in to a, a play. Uh, grant money is sometimes secure to take care of a lot of this. Uh, the primary partners uh, that we've been working with, uh, people like FEMA and the core, uh, the USGS is a primary partner of ours as well. Uh, I don't have the CWSD on here, but uh, again, uh, just kind of an overall look. It's a lot of entities that go into helping out and creating this program. Um, 
One thing I forgot to mention here, uh, in the western part of the country, east, west of the Rockies, there's one site that has flood inundation maps associated with it uh, currently, and that's the Boise River at Boise. They were a little bit ahead of us in trying to get going with this. Um, no other sites have been initiated out west as far as I know. There have been some talk of sites uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the, the Washington area primarily, uh, but right now the Boise River at Boise is the only site that has flood inundation maps in the western part of the country for our Ahabs. Uh, I'm gonna go this, through this fairly quickly because it's a lot of technical information. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the modeling uh, Mitch is much more uh, in tune with that than I would be. So uh, there's essentially four phases. Uh, the planning phase, this would, these two phases are likely the largest phases associated with this program. Uh, and then these are more or less just kind of ongoing uh, projects that, that continue to go once it's done. Um, Notice here, I, I show a lot of the partners through a lot of this and the contractors through a lot of this. Uh, there's one specific contractor that we use uh, to get the maps loaded onto our website because uh, they're the contractor that actually takes care of our website for us. Um, in the planning phase, and Mitch mentioned quite a bit of this, uh, what you start with is generally speaking a FEMA approved process. Uh, he talked about the 2D, um, steady versus unsteady, uh, using the LIDAR data as your basis for your mapping. Um, that's all well and good if you have all the, uh, the detailed flood insurance studies. If you don't have a detailed flood insurance study, um, you kind of have to start from scratch. Uh, so with a detailed flood insurance study, a lot, some of this is already taken care of for you. Uh, if, if we have a partner that doesn't have that, uh, we're pretty much back to square one, and there's a lot more resources uh, that are needed to produce those kinds of uh, uh, modeling uh, output and those kinds of maps. Uh, into the flying phase, planning phase as well, uh, we're looking at the different uh, types of locations. Uh, we do look for a suitable location. Not every location is suitable. Um, one that we do think is suitable is the Carson River at Carson City. Um, <coughs> because it doesn't, it's a confined area that doesn't have as much of an effect um, that, that could be a problem like backwater conditions, uh, boundary conditions, as might be further upstream. So the east and west forks are a little bit more of a concern uh, in, trying to, in trying to implement them on this because of the boundary conditions, especially through the Carson Valley. Uh, uh, this was one that we sort of ran into on the Truckee as well. Um, Jay talked about re-engineering North Truckee Drain to get it to not come into the river where Steamboat Creek comes into the river. Well, Steamboat Creek in and of itself can create a little bit of a problem when it comes to some modeling. And we've seen that with the weather service forecasts for flooding in the Truckee Meadows, that Steamboat Creek is a big part of that under certain scenarios, but not under every scenario. So the Truckee there is a little bit interesting too because if you get the heaviest rain in one part of the headwater, your timing is different than the heaviest rain in another part of the headwater. Uh, the RFC over in Sacramento really struggles with that sometimes. And actually creating a forecast for Vista, uh, it's not as much of an issue as a forecast for Reno, uh, for the Reno forecast as it is for Vista. Uh, I won't go ahead and just uh, bore everyone with this, but there's a lot of work that goes into creating all, putting all the analysis together before you start the actual modeling. Um, and again, uh, Mitch and HDR are much more in tune with this than I am. Uh, this I did want to linger on a little bit here. Um, this is what we would be very, very interested in. And it's uh, something that, that we are in the process of talking with in terms of what levels we might want to be looking at um, as far as um, what we use here. Um, first and foremost, uh, flood stage is a big one. Uh, we pretty much want to show flood stage because that's the beginning of, of where we begin to flood uh, and where it affects, potentially affects property as well, uh, especially. 
uh, and then we get into the life of property a little bit later on. Uh, the, um, the other things we want to look at specifically are not only just first flood stage, what we define as moderate flood stage and major flood stage and potentially the flood of record as well. Uh, in terms of getting those levels as a minimum, uh, as it turns out, we actually have uh, impact statements for the Carson River at Carson City every half a foot from about two feet below flood stage all the way up to uh, three feet above major flood stage. And then we have impact statements up to uh, the flood of record as well in every foot increment after that. These are things that we would hope to be able to, to put onto our pages. If not, at a bare minimum, we would be looking at minor, moderate, and major flood stage. Um, another big thing here, determine the study reach. So for us, um, we can't have a, a huge area because this one gauge won't won't show the entire picture for the entire Carson Basin. So we're, we're looking at maybe confining it to well below the confluence of the east and west forks, down to about here. And that's about as far as we can go with any kind of accuracy in the maps that are associated with that particular gauge. Now, if we had other gauges um, a little closer in, we could try to work it a little bit differently as well. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, uh, on the West Fork, our gauges at Woodford's, a lot of the big impacts are actually below Woodford's. Uh, as you get down further into the Carson Valley, the same kind of thing with the East Fork, where the gauge is closer to Markleyville, is the forecast gauge that we use. Those impacts are, generally speaking, well downstream from where the gauge is at, but that's the gauge that we have to use. not really going to linger on this and again trying to iterate this reiterate this again that this flood stage minor moderate flood levels um, are very important to us and very important to the way we would want our maps to look uh, that were available to the public uh, and to the emergency management uh, again more into the analysis phase uh, a lot of it is GIS work uh, that if on our end, uh, we do a lot of quality control and quality assurance in that GIS work to make sure everything looks right and, and fits uh, as we go into uh, how we produce these maps uh, for display on our web pages. And that's part of uh, this as well, quality assurance and quality control. Well, it'll be a two-phase kind of thing where we'll get the initial output uh, from the uh, modeling studies go through and, and do some uh, magic GIS work that our uh, GIS focal point at the office will be involved in, uh, as well as with the engineering firm. Uh, then go back, take a look at it, and actually do a second round of QC uh, before all the information gets sent up to the uh, contractor. Uh, contractor is the implement implementation phase. So our contractor, uh, which is Orion at this point, uh, takes the information in a map form that, that we give them, and then they mount it on this uh, AHAPS platform. Um, and it, they're static maps, but it looks a little interactive when you look at it. And you know, like I say, if I have time, I'm gonna go through and show you some of them. Uh, but generally speaking, there's just a lot of stages that we go through to make sure that everything looks right and everything is connected. And, and there's consistency within the data itself. Uh, I'm going to sum this up here and then I'm going to try to get on the web real quick here. Uh, these are primarily our goals. Uh, for everyone involved, receive the warning, understand the information, believe it, personalize the risk, make the correct decisions and respond. And the whole idea behind the AHAP Split and Nation program is really to enhance two, four, and five. And what we're finding in social science studies is that this is probably the biggest one, personalizing the risk. So that you know this is an area that's going, that I could be affected in, uh, more so than this area over here. So if I know that I'm in more danger at this site than I am at this site, well, let's get to this site instead. So this block's gonna flood, this block's not gonna flood, let's move out of the floodplain. 
before the water gets up there uh, so we don't get trapped. Uh, let me quickly get down here and, and see if I can get to show you. Uh, as a site on the Boise River at Boise. Uh, here to go to uh, under hydrology, rivers and lakes, that will pull up the main AHAPS page. I'll have to scroll down and find the one I'm looking for. The Boise River at Boise, if I select that site particularly, and I know it can be a little bit of a pain to get to some of this So this is just the, uh, the observed and the forecast uh, hydrograph uh, for that area. Uh, one th quick thing that I did want to note here is that a lot of the sites now have the FEMA flood layers on them. Uh, FEMA flood layers, which are the so-called 500-year, 100-year uh, floodplains and the floodway itself are considered poor man's AHAPS wet, uh, flood inundation maps. But a lot of the sites don't have flood inundation maps. So, it's, it's better than nothing at this point. And it's something that we just loaded up recently. Uh, if I go to that inundation mapping tab, uh, one thing you'll notice is a slightly different look to this. Um, so, on the left hand side here, uh, the Boise office does theirs in flow. Uh, flow or stage, it depends on uh, what side, part of the country that you're in. Uh, one thing you'll notice as I scroll through some of these, is as I get higher up into the categories, you'll start to see some of this uh, increase around the river itself. And those are the areas that are being inundated at these levels. But the other thing I wanted to point out, and I don't have to We're down here. These are the bounds as far as we can go uh, on how we want, how much of this we want to show. So it's not even the entire valley uh, that they have associated with this uh, particular gauge. Uh, this is the gauge site here. Uh, so it's upstream and a little bit down below, below the uh, gauge site itself. Uh, again, So another way to look at this, there's a transparency that I can set here. If I want to get less transparent or more transparent, I can move this around. But these, uh, I guess again, it looks like an interactive map. They are static maps associated, static maps associated with these particular flows. And again, the water depth column is over here. And actually, uh, if you look, if I put this there and put my uh, little marker there, uh, I can't see it because I don't have it scrolled up enough. I was going to try to show you the water depth. So there is a, there actually is a little depth indicator here as well. So when you're on the map and you have the mouse on that particular site, uh, you'll get a depth indication that's about a two foot range because it's not at, it's not precise down to you know, the, the, the half a foot or so. Uh, but it actually is a decent little tool to use. So with my cursor here, the depth at that location at the particular inundation level that I chose is between about two and a half and four and a half feet. So that would be how deep the water would be. Um, so anyway, that's that's just kind of a brief little demonstration of what it could be. Um, again, they use flow. A lot of the other sites, especially in the east, use stage as opposed to flow. Any questions?
Again, we're not doing the model. We're we're a display system. So, are you, are you so essentially, after HDR does their work, we take that information, do a little bit of QC to it, get it in a format that can be loaded onto these pages. So it's it's not a duplication of effort. It's an extension of what they're doing. And this is more for public display and for the emergency management community as a whole. Anyone can see this anytime they want to. This is focused on various frequencies of various stages. So you can look during the map see here's this stage. So by being able to see where the water is, you'll notice that it's overlying streets. And so it just kind of gives you an idea of what work they've done, translated into how do we look at this on a map of where I live. The best way to say that, Mitch? Yeah. In the white areas where it's previously flooded? Uh, the white areas here are where the water is the shallowest. One example when talking about how this can be used in the school, physical levels will be mapping for 500 years now. The schema looks at 100 year. Let's say we have a projection that's going to be a great flood coming down. Douglas County, we can look at this and say, okay, what roads are being inundated? If we know those roads are being inundated, where do you want to put your emergency equipment so you're not trapped? Or in Lyon County or something. So it's going to be a tool that we can say, hey, we know a big flood's coming down. It can be estimated to be, let's say, a 200 year event. What roads do we anticipate? Where are we going to be cut off? Where do we want to stage our people, emergency equipment for that? That's the nice thing about this tool. It gives an opportunity to look at that before the event gets here. Otherwise, we're kind of like, hey, we're over here. Oh, and then we can't get over there because all those roads are closed. It's going to be a very nice tool for emergency management. And what Ed said, this goes to the personalizing the risk. If, if you lived here, you would know at that level Pretty high likelihood there's going to be water in my yard at least, if not in my home. With Jay. I have kind of an odd question, and that is, what is the weather server, what's the government doing to ensure that when it starts to flood, that the website doesn't crash? <laughs> well, because, yeah. I mean, there's probably a secret, you know, secret code to the managers to get into their guaranteed access to certain parts of the then the public takes a media secondary because the managers are doing what Ed said. They're moving the equipment around, they're moving sand, they're moving they've got dumps, they've got blades, and they're moving their equipment. That's not an odd question, Jay. That's a, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that question. That's a little bit above me, but I understand the point. I do understand the point. Yeah. I can tell you, Jay, when I was in North Carolina, we had a separate site for emergency management that they could get in to see some things that, that weren't available to the general public. Uh, that was much more, uh, a little bit more down in the weeds. Thank you. Is that it for questions? Okay, thank you so much.